had you seen that uh, episode before? Yes. Amazing, isn't it? it? Seems like so long ago because there's been a new season since then, but particularly powerful. Um, I'm Stacy Wilson Hunt. I work for New York Magazine and Vulture here in LA as the Hollywood editor, and I'm very honored today to speak to a woman I admire and who's very charming and fun. Let's bring her out, Laverne Cox. <laughs> We need some levity after that episode, right? Okay. She's very shy, so you guys Hello. have to be patient. Hello, actors. <laughs> she doesn't like crowds. <laughs> We're gonna have to break her in today. Um, <laughs> so usually I start with sort of early career questions, but I do wanna talk about this episode first. Um, and it probably seems like a long time ago when you filmed it, it was probably like two years ago. Two years ago, point, right? Yeah. Remembering the process of making this episode, what do you recall is the most difficult aspect of it? Was the physicality with the water? Was it getting in her headspace and her feeling so isolated? I mean, what? Because there are a lot. Of, there's so much going on in this episode. It's and and she doesn't say much, and she's not in many of the episodes. But I when immediately when I read this script, I felt like I needed help. Um, and I have a fantastic acting coach in New York City named Brad Calcaterra, and I, I called Brad, and I was just like. I need help with this episode because it's like I've been because I've been doing a lot of research. So first of all, I, I, um, well, I've been shooting a documentary about a young woman named Cece McDonald who is a transgender woman who um, spent um, 19 months in a men's prison for defending herself, and she spent a lot of her time in prison in solitary. So. Um, we were literally shooting Free CC, and I had been talking to CC about her time in solitary when I got this episode. And then I had done research on top of having talked to CC and understood that oftentimes people in solitary confinement experience um, um, depression and they're often suicidal. Over 50% of people are suicidal and there's delusions and hallucinations. And I was like, how do we sort of you know, convey that. And it is suggested in the script that she's lost a sense of time, right? She's not sure what day it is. So how do we like, you know, have a specific um, um, physical approach and drop in all of the sort of trauma of that. And also, if you recall from season three, Sophia was sent to shoe because she was assaulted <laughs> in her in her salon and she was sent to shoe for her protection, which happens to transgender people all over the country um, who, they're, who are serving in prison. They're often serving their time in men's prisons in solitary for our protection. So it was a, it was. It was real life stuff, and I and so I did a lot of research. And once I sort of did all that research, I went to Brad, and I was like, "This is sort of the research, and this is the script, and how can we um, make some specific choices to kind of convey what um, is going on for Sophia?" And she's physically transformed too. The prison has been privatized, and the sort of if if you're a fan of the show, you know, in the previous season, Sophia was you know wigged and and had um, prison makeup, but she was made up. Uh, nonetheless, and so she's been stripped of all that. She's lost weight, she hasn't been eating. So there's a physical, um, so the physical um, sort of um, transformation too was actually really important in terms of telling the story of this is not the same woman that, we, that we've come to know in previous seasons. So there was that piece and then really trying to make specific choices about the physicality and then what was going on in the emotional state, the, 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 the layering the trauma with the sort of disassociation, the hallucinations and the suicidal um, stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was like, oh, um, so, so at the end of a day of shooting, and by, by the way, how long did it take to shoot this particular episode? This episode happened over, I think we did it in two or three days. I forget, okay. it was two That's years ago. That's relatively fast. Yeah, two or three days. Um, and we were in a, on a special set because um, we set fire to that. The water and the that. fire, that's not going to be a real. I love that. I love that. First, when I saw it in the script, I was like, yes, yes. I get to set fire to my cell. It's so badass, right? And so we were in. Um, I definitely rooted for you when you set the cushion on fire. That was exciting. Thank you. She was a firefighter, if you recall. Um, so she knows how to do that. Um, so um, so we were in a special set. So it was what was interesting about shooting that in my solitary scenes is that I was um, I was away from everybody else. We were in a special set for a fire set just in case you know you know something happened. And so I I didn't have any contact with anyone from the um, so there were all these new actors coming in. And so when I finally got out of shoe later in the season, spoiler alert, it was I was. The actor, um, the actor me, I was having the same experiences of Sophia, of like, who are these people and what's going on at Litchfield and this is a completely new place. So I didn't really have to act that. Um, 
But what, 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 one other thing I'll say about what I love about this episode and the, what, what, the way they wrote it in and what I love about Sophia is that she, I mean, really what we're talking about is a trauma response. And when we're, we're traumatized, we're in fight, flight, or freeze. And obviously in prison, you can't flee. <laughs> um, and so you in the freeze, the freeze is really a shutdown. And what I love about Sophia is that she chose to fight. And there was, there was a moment when, I mean, the choice to flood her cell is like, Will these will these motherfuckers let me drown, or will they get me the fuck out of here? And that, so it it becomes this life or death kind of thing. And then and she could also burn herself to death too, and be and so 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 there was the, if she is going to be treated in such an inhumane way, she's going to go out fighting. And I and I and I love that. I love that. But I also love the moment where Caputo's at the door, and we know that he cares. And he doesn't want something to happen her, to her. And I think, I think, and he's kind of a goofy character on and off. But I really, actually, feel like he's in some ways the moral center of the show because he's never comfortable with the bureaucracy of the prison, with you know the way the inmates are treated. And I sort of, I think we look to him as kind of he's the hope. And and so there's that sweetness where he's at the door and he's like, why are you doing this to yourself? So I think that that comes through in a way that I hadn't seen before with him. Yeah, that he, Nick is so fantastic. I love Nick so much. And he's, he's such a great guy in real life. But it's, I don't know if Caputo is, I mean, like, it's very tricky with Caputo, right? And I think maybe part of me is like the character who's still kind of like, you motherfucker. You know, so it's, 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 it, what's weird for me, like, okay, I'm going to digress. Do you watch, does anybody watch Power here on Stars? So, the, um, um, the guy, the actor Michael, who plays Tariq, plays my son on Orange Is the New Black. So I'm watching Power, and I'm watching Michael as Tariq, like really fuck up. And I'm like, what are you doing? I feel like, and he's not my child in real life, but I've endowed him with so much that I feel like this whole thing. So it's it's it gets really weird for me sometimes that I I, I can't. Caputo is Caputo has not been good to Sophia. I, he just hasn't, and I and I I, I don't. I'm holding out hope for everyone involved. So obviously the show's been in our lives for five years now, almost five years. We came out in 2013. Is that five, four or five years? Four or five years, okay. Yeah, Jesus. And I mean, it's the you know, big understatement of the century, but you know, I think it's changed your life a lot. You've changed our lives. Can you put into words what the last four years have meant to you? I know, that's a big, big, big question. Huge. So um, it's funny. I've been I've been journaling about this lately. Five years ago, five years ago this summer, I was um, I had gotten um, a f um, I decided that um, my acting career was probably over. I was probably done, and I should go to graduate school, and I should figure out do something for real to get a, a real career. Um, and so a friend of mine had just gotten to Columbia, and he sold me his GRE um, study materials at a discount. He gave me like all the books for like a hundred hundred bucks. It was a lot of books. They were like probably. Five hundred dollars plus um, worth of books for like a hundred bucks, and so I'm like sort of studying for the GRE, and I'm looking at different grad schools. I wanted to do like a women's studies journalism major thing, and, and I didn't think I wanted to get a PhD. I was thinking like <laughs> a master's degree. And very few schools have master's degrees in, in women's studies. Anyway, I digress. So like I was in the space of like thinking I was done, and um, and I wasn't really getting auditions because there's just not a lot of parts for girls like me. And um, I was at, um, it was actually August of 2012. I was at a, at a GLAD event, GLAD Carnival. I remember my manager, Paul, Paul's back there. Hey, Paul. Paul was like, there's a new web series on, on Netflix. I'm like, Netflix. Um, <laughs> and he it's about set in a women's prison and there's a part for you. She's like the prison hairstylist. And I'm like, what? Um, and it's recurring. I'm like, oh, cool. Cause like earlier, so in 2011, I had done like seven different independent films. Like you probably haven't seen any of them, because um, that's how it is. Um, and and I was like, next year I want to do, I want to book a recurring role on a TV show. That that was my goal. I wrote it down. It was when I was writing it down every day. And so like you know, I did. I've done. I did my last movie. I think in uh, October or early November of 2011. 
and then December, January, February, March, April, May, which isn't a long time because I've had years of no work. So in the grand scheme of things, you know, going, I guess, October, November to like September, we started Orange is almost a year, not quite a year. Um, and I was in rent arrears too. So I had um, gotten an um, eviction notice in my apartment from my apartment building in February of 2012. And I set up an arrangement with my landlord so I could um, pay like $300 a month so I wouldn't be evicted. Um, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> it got real girl. It got really war, real. These are war stories, you guys. <laughs> And um, so I'm like, I need to go to grad school. I need to pay my rent. I need to like do so, do get a real job. And um, Paul told me that there was this um, show about a women's prison that was apart from me, and I auditioned for it. Um, I think in September of 2012. I remember I went. I put a short wig on. And I just put a little powder on for shine. I didn't wear any makeup and like just um, some jeans and um, like a little um, spaghetti strap T-shirt or something. And it was one audition and I booked it. And I was like, cool, um, I have a job. And I had no idea at the time that there would be a backstory or I, that it would be anything to do. You know, the first episode, I'm in one scene. Then I'm in two scenes, I think, in the second episode. So I didn't, but I was just so happy to have a job, girl. It was a union you know, actors we know, right? I had a job. <laughs> and it was a job I had manifested. It was a job I had manifested. This was Jennifer Houston, of course, the casting person. She's wonderful. What What do you remember about your audition? How How quickly did it go by? I mean, did you think about it now, and it's just sort of like a fog? <laughs> it was so weird because it was. Um, we I only did two scenes. I did um, the F Sophia's only scene from the pilot, where I, if you recall, I think I'm in the l cafeteria lunch line, and I tell um, um, Piper that I can do her hair and don't go to Danita; she'll burn the shit out of your scalp. Um, there's that moment, and then so I did that scene, and then in the third episode, the um, famous duct tape flip flop bathroom scene I did that and so I remember I just remember going into the room I had prepared and um, I did it one way and Jen was so sweet she's like oh you're so good I'm like oh she's so sweet and I auditioned for Jen once twice before um, once or one thing was once before and she and I remember she loved me it was what I was told but then they ended up giving it was a trans role they ended up giving it to a cisgender um, a man to play, which happens. We'll get into um, that in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I auditioned for Jen once before, so she knew she knew the work, and I did it once. She gave me an adjustment. I did it again, and then like we did it another t third time for good measure, and the, the two scenes, and that was it. There was no callback. There was they booked me from that from the tape, and isn't that crazy? <laughs> And you know when you you know sometimes the, the process of testing six and seven times to get a part it was just the easiest honestly the, one of the easiest auditions I've had and I think it just I clicked with the material and I understood if you've God if you could get a copy of the pilot script for Orange Is the New Black it jumps off the page it's so unbelievably well written and the characters are so vivid and the world is so vivid so that it's so that it really is I, I talked to Emma Miles about this all the time she says it's all on the page well with, with, with our show that it's so it's written so well that it's just you just you just ooze into it you know you know you ooze, you ooze into it right you know what I'm talking about <laughs> what have you what have you learned about yourself as an actor from being on the show maybe you've surprised yourself or were there depths to which you can go through this art that maybe you didn't know you could do before? The strange thing is I knew I could. I knew I could, oh, I could, I could cry. I knew I could, but I just never had a chance. I never had a chance to. I remember when I got the um, script for Sophia's backstory episode, I remember saying to myself, this is what I've been waiting for my whole career. This is the thing, I've been, I've been going to acting class every week, you know, <laughs> like really, you're going to acting class every week and, and working in restaurants, you know, and going doing the off-Broadway off plays and the student films for free and the independent films for like, you know, SAC, ultra low budget um, rate and just doing the, doing the grind, doing the thing that we do just to work and just to get experience and all of those things prepared me for, for that moment to be directed by Jodie Foster and to have, finally have this rich material that I could really just go there with. And so I, I knew in my spirit I could do it, but, but I've learned, what I've learned on Orange is um, 
be, it's, uh, there's always things to give. I would always give myself little assignments. I'm such a dork. I give myself little assignments. I'm going to work on listening more this season, or I'm going to work on like my unfulfilled need more this season, or I'm going to work on being an action or objective or things like that. So I give myself little assignments um, each season so I can try to sort of work and get better at, at, at the thing that I do. This particular, this, ep this season, season four, and this whole sort of um, solitary shoe um, um, narrative was really exciting for me because it's almost like a totally different character. It's like this is not the Sophia <laughs> that we've come to know and it was so exciting because I mean I, I still love our show and I think our show is um, I think it's better than ever honestly after five seasons but like you know you want to do different things as an actor and this was that and it was I was so excited and it was so the material was so much bigger than me. So I this was really hard. This was hard for me because I had it had to all sort of be it sort of simmers in a way. And in, in a lot in some ways it simmers and then uh, certainly she has her explosions. <laughs> if you don't you know, I'll drown myself if you you know I'm giving It's almost like a whatever. one woman show in a way. It was almost like this like self contained short yeah. film. I mean know? I had scenes with the guard and I had scenes with um with, with Nick. But um yeah, a lot of it was that work that you, you know, it's kind of like when you do the character private moment, you know, stuff. And those of you who've studied that um, sort of Strasbourg or Susan Batson uh, process. Any Susan Batson students in the house? I, hey, I got you. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and I think they do that at Strasbourg too, the sort of character private moment or personal private moments. So, so all those things that you, it's the things that you train for. And it's, it's amazing to get to have a storyline where you get to like, you know, work those muscles especially in a large ensemble i mean yeah. this cast is huge it's so huge <laughs> and then we then they write such great things yeah. for us so to be in a, such a basically I'm, I'm a, i've been a guest actress for like five seasons of a show with <laughs> these really fantastic storylines isn't that amazing it is. it's really amazing jenji cohen is is a genius and she's i'm so great she's changed my life she's and a magical person yeah, she is she really is and what did you learn from jody who i'm just one of my favorites of all time director actor she's an amazing human being. That is, I have like th top a top three of like my favorite, just in terms of the process of being on set or being in rehearsal or doing the work. And and Jodie Foster's top three in terms of just this experience of working with her as a director. Jodie Foster directed the backstory in season one for my character Sophia, episode three of season one, and Jodie is just. She's a light. She's just, she's so down to earth. And I was so, I mean, it's Jodie Foster. Could you imagine? In my very first day on, um, on set for Orange, I was, um, I was, went to craft services to see what the food was like. And um, <clears throat> so I'm at craft services checking out the food. And then um, this little woman comes up to me and she's like, hi, I'm Jodie. I'm directing episode three. And I'm like. I know who you are. <laughs> and she was like, it's your first day, right? Let me show you around. And then Jodie Foster commences to give me a tour of the set. And I'm just like, first day on the job. First day, first episode. See, I'm like, inside I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like inside I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And she's asking me questions about myself and I'm like, yeah. And she was so cool and so dope. And then I didn't know, at the time, I didn't know that episode three would be my backstory. I didn't know any of this stuff. Well, obviously um, she knew, because that's why she was she talking She knew, and she was there right. watching and get a vibe for the set. It was the first time she directed for television. Right, well, and I remember interviewing her about that episode, yes. and I was so <clears> taken <throat> with how much it meant to her. I mean, she's directed oh. numerous features, and mm. the excitement in her voice of knowing that she was doing something different and edgy and very female forward and... It was amazing to think this woman's won multiple her Oscars. You know. Her enthusiasm, I remember we were shooting one day, it was one of the greatest greatest moments of, of shooting that I've had. It was, um, it was this episode where my character, Sophia, in the backstory we see Sophia through, go through her transition, um, her gender transition, and this episode, the scene where she dresses as a woman for the first time in front of her wife, Crystal. That scene, <clears throat> I'd actually rehearsed that scene with Jodie Foster in her office. So, we were, I'm, so I'm like trying to, luckily Jodie had never done TV before, so she didn't know that we don't meet with the director beforehand, which is great. It was yeah, really great. Yeah, we always meet with the director so before. So I, no, I, she probably knew, but she just wanted to meet with me anyway. So I had like two, three meetings with Jody before we um, shot, and thank God, because they got, by the third meeting, she was like, let's try the scene. So we, we, I got up, and I'm doing a scene with Jody Foster in her office, and I was just kind of like, oh, thank 
you, Jesus. And this is like, you know, the rent, this is like five years ago when I'm like paying $300 a month in rent and like, you know, I, there's the rent's due, you know, and I'm like doing this thing with Jodie Foster. And then I, but that was such a powerful moment because I was like, she's just another actor and she's a human being. And that allowed me to be able to be on set with her and not be like, oh, you're Jodie Foster. Um, and it was, it was fantastic. And so when we were shooting that scene, and it was, I think we were literally in the 18th hour of the day. It had been a really long day. And she just, we did a take and she pops out with like all this energy and she has all this energy. So you have energy and you just want to go again. She's like, let's go again. And we did like coverage that was like 360 degrees. Like literally we covered like every inch of the space in the room. And it was just glorious. It was absolutely, um, Tanya Wright, who plays my wife, was so dialed in in this moment for Sophia and Crystal, I, there's a moment when I say to Crystal, you don't have to stay. Like, you don't have to stay. That If this is too much, me transitioning is too much, you don't, and I still get emotional about it now, and it's like, God, that was five years ago. But then she's like, where would I go? And it was just so human and real, and it was this relationship, and then Jody was there, and it just, it's the moment, it's the moment when, Something ha I felt something happened that I, we didn't expect to happen, and that is always what I my hope and my dream when I um when I when I'm in a scene and something I did not expect to happen happens. Either the director says something to me, or or um, the other actor has done something to me that like or said something to me or done something to me, and I just and something happens that I didn't expect to happen. And um and Jane Fonda calls it. Paul sent me this um this interview with Jane Fonda. She calls it like sort of this magical dance. I believe is the way she puts it. Where like and she said in, in it, I think this is like 20 years ago or something. She says in like 48 movies, this happened maybe eight times when the magic happens and the director and the lighting and the camera and the through actor and everything just like becomes this thing and I and I really I felt that way I don't know how it reads I'm so not objective but in the moment I think all we have as actors are those moments on set with with another actor with our director and our and a cinematographer and just and it happens or it doesn't and it just felt and magical. you have to love that process too you yeah. can't be worried about the final result no. and how, how is this going to look and how we're are not the in control in film and tv it's the director it's the editor i'm like why did you use this take instead of the other take and i know i did it differently and it was better and so you can't, i can't be I, I don't have any control over that so it really is those mo those moments on set with the director and the actor that and and hopefully something really human happens well, it definitely did. <laughs> I still think about that scene and with you trying on the clothes, and it's so resonant and so beautiful. Um, so a week ago, right now, I was speaking to Jeffrey Tambor about Transparent on this very stage, and I've talked to him many times on this subject, and he's very candid about cisgender people playing these parts. Um, a lot has changed on that front since you kind of blazed this trail. Um, how do you feel about that now when we know there are so many talented performers who can play these parts and who maybe just haven't gotten the chance? God, every, well, everybody needs a chance. Everybody just needs a shot to try. And for years, I just wanted to get in the room. I just wanted to just get in the room and show them what I had. You know, if you want to cast somebody else, fine. But just can I get in the room? I just wanted a shot. It's complicated. I mean, I've evolved over the years when it comes to this. Because as an actor myself, I would never want to suggest that another actor shouldn't play a part because this is what we are trained to do. We're trained to step into the skins of other human beings and live those lives. And whether you're trans or not or, or whatever. But but Jen Richards, a brilliant um, um, actress, writer, producer, she um, uh, wrote and produced and starred in um, her story, the uh, Emmy nominated um, YouTube series, um, which is great on Twitter genius. too. <laughs> Sorry? She's great on Twitter. She's great. Amazing. Her Twitter <laughs> feed is lit. It's been, it's been amazing <laughs> lately. <laughs> it's lit. Um, but Jen, um, Jen Jen made this incredible point that um, she believes that particularly when um, cisgender men play transgender parts, it leads to violence against trans women. And the reason is that she feels that is that it reinforces the idea that transgender women are really men. So that when you see a, 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 a Jared Leto play um, a, a, the trans character he played in Dallas Buyers Club, and then he arrives at the Oscars with his beautiful beard and long hair, and he's very sexy. And, but he's very much, you know, embodying a certain kind of masculinity, it sends a message to all the men who are attracted to girls like me that underneath all of this that it's, it's Jared Leto. And it's it's not Jared Leto <laughs> under here. F FYI. <laughs> He's nowhere to be found here. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
so so I think there's an and and it's and it's almost about the historical moment that like we're at a historical moment now where trans people are being um, attacked um, in state legislatures. Luckily in Texas, they just overturned that horrible anti-trans bathroom bill, but there's still one in North Carolina, despite what they say about the repeal and the um, Lambda Legal, assuming the state of North Carolina, um, the, um, the Trump administration has rescinded um, guidelines for how transgender students should be treated in schools. It's, it extends beyond bathrooms. Obviously his attempt to um, ban trans people from the military. Trans people are under attack. The murder rate um, amongst trans people is higher than it's ever been. More visibility has actually become dangerous for people. I think what's, well, the murder, the, the, the violence against trans people probably has not changed. I think the reporting is probably getting better. Um, we are we're still being murdered disproportionately and I think that's been going on for a very long time I think when, what we're seeing with state legislatures and the rescinding of of guidelines and trying to ban us from here I think that's a political strategy from people on the far right there's a group I forget Alliance for families or something or, or some some group that has made a concerted effort to go to state um, Congress folks and lobby them and say you need to introduce these anti-trans bathroom bills to basically use trans people to, as a scapegoat to turn out and you know and scare people basically fear monger scare people about like um trans people in bathrooms and people with these genitalia or whatever fear monger to sort of turn out a certain population and pander to um people's fears and what that does is feeds on misinformation about who we are and i think over 85 percent of um, americans don't know someone who's transgender so what they mostly get um, in terms of who transgender people are, is from the media. So how we tell these stories uh, on television and in film, it's really, it's, it's, it's life or death. And, and uh, talking about Dallas Buyers Club for a second, last fall I did a conversation with the trans talent from Transparent, Zachary and Reese. Amazing. And yes, amazing group of people. Actually, Rain is here too. I saw Rain. Hey, Rain. Con hey girl. Consultant on the show. Um, and I, I asked, I asked the, the talent, I said, so you have a movie like this. It was an important story to tell. You know, great, Ron, Ron was a pioneer. He helped a lot of people. So what should they have done when they, you know, the Robbie Brenner and the people who made that movie, sort of like, okay, there's this character. And Reese said, from day one, there should have been a trans person reading that script, consulting on that script before casting. If you can find a trans woman to play the part, great. If not, make sure there's somebody involved in the process. And for all the work, I mean, it took that, what, like 20 years to make that movie. It was a really long time. It's frustrating to know that they didn't have that element in place. And that really has stuck with me when you think, okay, well, if you're telling these stories, <laughs> you have someone in the room who knows what these what's, stories mean. You what's, know? what's interesting to me about, um, it's very, it's, it's such a huge honor to be, you know, apparently the only openly transgender person nominated for a primetime Emmy in an acting category. But for, tw oh, for decades, um, since um, um, Dog Day Afternoon, cisgender people have been playing transgender characters and being nominated for and won Oscars, Emmys, Golden Globes, you name it, you know, all these awards. And so there's an interest in our stories, but really there's an interest in having us take a part in telling those stories. And that feels like exploitation, actually, is what it feels like. And it feels like this strange erasure. Jen Richards, again, um, noted uh, on Twitter that the um, woman, because Dr. The Afternoon is, of course, based on a true story, that the trans woman who inspired the story, she would look to transgender to play herself. This is what she was told, that she looked to transgender. She didn't read as trans to the public. Um, so they, they needed to hire someone who looked more transgender. Ooh. It was Chris Sarandon. I mean, this was who the played. 70s, yeah. yeah Chris and he, he, he was a wonderful actor. So I'm not, you know, I, I love actors. I love, I really do. I love you guys. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, that Ooh, is that's a clueless perspective. I mean, it's, it really, it's but it was like this was like 30 plus years. Sydney ago. Lumet, right? Um, I mean, it was sort of a Sydney Lumet, direct giant of the cinema. No one's yeah. going to sort of take and that the and director of Dallas Buyers Club. I understand when he was asked about you know a transgender person playing um, um, Jared Leto's character, he's like, I don't think there are transgender actors. He 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 said this. He's he's look it up, girl. He said it, and I was like, like, I was like, we're here. 
we're, we really, we really, we've, and we've been here. And there's a long history, you know, of, of, of um, Alicia Brevard and Alexandra Billings, who's been around, and Candace Kane, and all these actors who've come before us, who've um, done amazing, then the, and all the trans actors who were living stealth, who didn't feel comfortable coming out, because that was the protocol for decades, that you, that you transition and you disappear. So um, obviously I have a lot to say about this subject. <laughs> I know, that's why we're talking about it. <laughs> um, so actually we have a lot of good audience questions. I wanna make sure we hey. don't miss them because that's why we're here. Uh, this is from Rain and Amy. <laughs> hey. And they address you as Laverne the Queen, which is appropriate. <laughs> They obviously know you. You're queens, too. <laughs> um, they say, did your brother, who guest starred in season one, want to act as much as you did when you were both young? No. <laughs> so um, I want to know how favorite, this came about. <laughs> one of my favorite stories, so one of my favorite stories about my brother, um, he, um, he was on the subway, and um, he was on the subway, and someone was like, oh, my God, are you Laverne Cox from Orange is the New Black? And he told me this story, and he was like, and I was like, um, he's got facial hair, and it just, I'm just like, do they think that like I like go out leave set and I like I'm like, and grow a beard? It can't. It's not possible. FYI. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm like, oh, and then he's and so my brother tells that story, and I was like, really? And he was like, and so my brother's like, my sister's offended that they thought that she was a man, and I'm offended that they thought I was an actor. <laughs> so my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so my brother certainly has no desire to act. He's actually quite talented, though, I think. Um, he's quite good. What does he do? Um, he's production? a musician yeah. and multimedia artist. So he sings. He's a countertenor. He sings operatically. And he plays the piano. And he, he creates these um, this music that's sort of inspired by blues and, and indigo spirituals and opera. And he tells these really harrowing tales that are um, deal with sort of um, sexual exploitation around race. And um, he, one of his... Um, Pieces of Speculum Orum deals with the sort of transatlantic slave trade, and apparently um, a lot of slaves starved themselves, and rather than being um, placed in, in, um, in servitude, they would starve themselves in the slave ships, so their slave um, traders would force feed them, and they would use a device called a Speculum Orum. Wow. And my, to force feed the slaves, and my brother um, did a piece called Speculum Orum, wow. that were like a long, um, sort of operatic, hour-long piece that sort of explored that whole thing. He's very intense oh, and brilliant. You. Powerhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Holidays must be really fun at your house. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, this is from Michaela. Michaela would like to know, do you plan to produce projects? I know oh, you've already yes. done some producing. I've done some producing. Um, I've done some non-scripted um, producing. And now I want to have been, the long-term goal has always been to produce scripted um, work for, for as vehicles for me and other uh, other actors. So that is, we're in the process <laughs> now. Um, it's exciting, but it's also, it's, it's you know, it's a lot of, it's daunting. It but is. it's I'm excited. There's some, we've gotten... There's some cool people we're going to be working with. It's actually really exciting when I think about I'd it. I'd love for you to um, break that news right here. What, what, tell me what you're working on. Not with. yet. <laughs> we're not ready to I talk about it. I had to ask. It. I had to ask. Of course. Um, from Tracy, she would like to know, what is your best advice, the ultimate question, best advice for actors? What Susan Batson, my acting mentor, said to me years ago is that the folks who make it in this business are the ones who persevere, the ones who never give up. And... Um, So I just keep don't ever give up. And I what the what 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 I did was I um figured out a way to go to acting class so that I'm I and I just I just did an acting workshop a few weeks ago. So I'm always trying to get better. And that is the piece too. Halle Berry talks about this in her inside the actor studio that she's always like coached and always worked with different actors and always been in this process of trying to get better. I think that's crucial. And acting classes can get expensive. Figure out figure it out. Figure out a way. I was not paying rent <laughs> and, going, and going to class and getting headshots and doing these things, but commit to the commit to the process of getting better. And and um, what 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 is required of us is that we have to understand our our joy, our happiness, our demons, our traumas in such a deep and profound way so that we can give that to, to our, our characters and to the stories that we tell. So that work is ongoing, the know thyself, the I'm aware, Susan would start every class, I'm aware of the, whatever is happening in the moment. Um, so that constant sort of vigilance around 
uh, mining the instrument and you are the instrument. And so that's the process. And so about, I think it's a really about being in class, knowing the business and understanding the, the logistics of the business and what that takes because it is a business. And um, in this day and age now, I think now we can you can make your own projects. You can make your your short films, your YouTube, whatever, and and be in the process of doing. I think the the manifesting it when you when I because I try to w wake up every morning and write five things I'm grateful for and five things I'm manifesting. The manifestation is it, writing it down. It's, it's it's an action, and then you follow it up with more action that day. What am I doing every single day for my artist for for for, for the for the instrument part the the this and then what am I doing for the, for the business part as well and yeah, just that must also help facilitate the, the sense that you're in charge I think a lot of people in this business feel like they're waiting for other people to help them and call them and hire them and this way this yeah, I think when you when you can create your own work you're definitely way more in charge and, and and then you book a job in someone else's show and then that control goes too. you, could, you there's so many things that we can't control and doing the spiritual work to be fine with letting go of the control too I think the spiritual piece is like because when it when it happens, you, are you spiritually ready to deal with the fame? Because there's very few, I don't know that any acting schools that de tell you how to <laughs> deal with being famous and being stopped in the airport and people writing horrible things about you on Twitter or all of those things that come, that come with having a su potentially successful acting career. Um, so the spirit, there's a spiritual process that, that I think is really important too to get you ready when it happens. We've seen all the people who, you know, overdose and, and go crazy and, and, yeah. and, and yeah. you don't want to be that person. No. Uh, Max would like to know, and obviously we've seen that this episode that falls into this category, has there been an episode that you have felt a particular connection with? So obviously beyond tonight's, which we've talked about. Yeah, yeah. I think it always needs to be personal. It always needs to be deeply, deeply personal. And I have to. Um, I was. Um, I had a chemistry reading for a film on Saturday, and I and I coached with a new um, coach. And I I know this intellectually, but there's still a part of me that wanted to like sort of make the character circumstances not mine and not make it deeply personal. So it's always really personal for me. This one particularly. Um, this. This one was intense, I think, because we were shooting um, the Free CC documentary, because so many trans folks are in solitary confinement right now, and it's so real, and very few people are talking about it um, still. Um, the suicide piece, the, the, the wanting to die, um, or being willing to die, all that stuff was, um, was hard. It was really, really hard, and like you're, um, just um, watch watch the lovely um, Hollywood Reporter Roundtable where I think it was Jessica Lang. Um, I'm doing I'm in therapy too, and she sort of reiterated what my therapist says to me that the nervous system does not know that it's make believe. The nervous system does not know, and also the nervous system doesn't know that the trauma may have happened 20 years ago. A trigger can happen, and then all of it is right here, and that but that is also the gift for the actor. It's 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 a gift that the nervous system does not know. So then, if we know what the triggers are, boom, we're in the circumstances. But sometimes it's hard to get out of them. <laughs> sometimes when the director yells "cut," it's like, you, you know, it doesn't just you don't just shake it off, you know, so so easily. So um, yeah, you, therapy is great. Like, <laughs> therapy is awesome. That is great advice. And how do you go home after a day of shooting a scene like that and? Are you, you know, are you meditating? Are you just being peaceful? Are you by yourself? Are you watching Real Housewives? Like, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> Trying to think I'm like watching the Real least Housewives. Brain activity you could, this you know. particular one was hard because it was, um, again, it, w it required me to go to some of my real dark stuff. Um, and um, I, there's a part of me that lives for that because it's like, yeah, that's what I'm, but then there's a part of me like, it's like, I, 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 didn't, I didn't shake it off for a while. It just, it was one of those things because again, and this was two years ago, I hadn't, hadn't found my somatic therapist to, uh, you know, I have here in LA now. Um, and so I, you know, it was took a couple weeks to get, to kind of shake it because the, again, the nervous system was like, it's the, where's the threat? It's like, where is the threat? And so I don't, and, and I've, safety has been a huge issue my whole life, feeling safe. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's the gig. <laughs> and this is just my own final question, which is if you are back here in five years on this stage, what do you hope that we will be discussing? My seventh Emmy nomination, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> and I'd love to be talking about a project that I've produced, um, that I've that produced that um, where I've um, maybe I'm starring in, and I've we've hired like all these trans people to act in it and like work behind the scenes and write the show and produce and On network TV would um, be cool too. Yeah, yeah. There's some things in the works. We'll we'll see. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens. I just had a show on um, on CBS called Doubt. Yes. That. Um, That's why I reference network TV. <laughs> thank you. Um, I it was such a such a wonderful ride. So I just want to keep working. I think the big thing for me for years is that I just wanted to work, and um, at the end of the day, right now in this stage of my career, dealing with the, all the sort of star stuff or whatever, because that's that's the thing. I still just want to work. I still want to when I want just prepping for that that chemistry read that I did on Saturday was so, or taking that um, acting workshop I just took at the studio here in L.A. was just it's about the work. It's about getting material and and and, and preparing it and being in. In a, in a moment with another actor or several actors in an audience and just seeing what happens, that is um, that is still the greatest joy uh, for me. Yeah. Well, thank you on that note. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Vote for L. <laughs>